Destination Yuri, of course, uh, delighted to be with you. Uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, uh, you're very welcome. John Woolsey from the like from Ulster Wildlife. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks, yeah. uh, thanks for the invitation to come down. No, it's so good it. because any chance we have to get a bit of the countryside into the studio, we want to do that. And uh, you're a man of the countryside before you're anything else. I am indeed. I'm What's indeed. your provenance in the country? Oh, what have you well, done? Uh, are you a farmer? Uh, well, I, I grew up a bit in, in rural Tyrone, just outside Dungannon, and then... Uh, after school, I went to Greenmount College to study ah, agriculture. Yeah, did that for three years and did a bit of farming and, and various other bits and pieces. I've always been really interested in the countryside, mm -hmm. and my mother's people were way back would have been farmers, you know. Yeah. So I have that association with the land. But wildlife, the, the local wildlife of Northern Ireland is what really fascinates me, because yeah. we have a a great wealth of wildlife here on our own doorsteps, mm -hmm. you know. And, and and to me, it's important that local communities get interested in that and, and get involved in what they have around yeah. them, you know, and, and to preserve what we have. I suppose in a, in a, it's a mixed blessing, this age of computers and all the rest of it, because young people can go on the computer and Google barn owls or Google uh, red kites or mm -hmm. Google golden eagle or whatever, and they get all of that. But the, the downside of that is they might spend too much time on the computer and not enough time out under the stars. That's right. And, and working with Ulster Wildlife, that, that's something that we're very aware of and that we try to promote getting families and young people out into the countryside to experience what there is there. You know, uh, we run a lot of events for, for families and for young people. I myself, I'm, I'm the barn owl officer. Yes. Um, I'm working at the minute on a three year project called Be There for Barn Owls. Yes. Now, Thankfully, that's funded by totally by the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is, is great. And I'll say to any of your viewers, if you do the lottery, thank you very much, because you're paying <laughs> my wages, and it's great. <laughs> and you're, you're saving the lives of the barn owls as well. I, exactly. So, I mean, it's be there for barn owls, and a big part of that project is to engage with local communities. Yeah. Uh, in areas where we know there are some barn owls, but we need to do something to halt the decline. The barn owl is a priority species in Northern Ireland, which basically means there are certain measures have been implemented by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and by other NGOs like ourselves and RSPB to try... Which is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Birds, yeah. Yep. Yep. And we would work with other partners in, in, in the project to, to, uh, to halt the decline of barn owls. Barn owls are at a stage now where there could be as few as 50 breeding pairs left yeah. in Northern Ireland. This would be a very fine house, Andrew, if you can... Uh, a pan down to the Barn Owl House, uh, and we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. This would be a very fine place of residence. Oh, this is, for this a, is a barn. Uh, Where would you plant that? Well, this is a. Don't get up, just point yeah, to it. This, this is a, an external exterior Barn Owl nest box. There are ones we also designed for putting into buildings and barns. Yes. Now. This is for putting up on a, on a gable wall outside or up on a tree. Okay? Yes. Now, it looks a, an awful size of a thing. It now. is. And you can imagine. I'm up a ladder or dangling on a rope, 20 foot up a beech tree, trying to get this attached. Okay, now uh, it's designed, I guess, because the, the barn owl weighs this up. It's, it's not a particularly big bird, but you have to remember the barn owl may lay seven eggs, and yeah. if they all hatch out, you've got seven young mm -hmm. ones in this for maybe 10, 11 weeks, mm -hmm. and they're all growing mm -hmm. rapidly, so they need a bit of room. room. Okay, so it's designed, I guess, an a, a frame like a Swiss chalet, like a yeah. Swiss chalet type of, type of setup. And it's designed like that, really, just to turn the weather. And is the in, inside of it, it, it's from the top of the opening down to the ground. Yeah. So it's there, And there's a door at the bottom that you can open in order to clean it out and that's things. That's what that's for, indeed. Yeah. That, that's, that, that's really just an inspection door yeah. and to clean it out. What you do find with these, unfortunately, the jackdaws love them. And the jackdaws will carry in sticks right up, oh. all this right to the top yeah. of sticks. The barn owl doesn't carry anything into this. The barn Except mice. The, Exactly, what it's, they're going to eat. Going you know, to eat. Mice and young rats and pygmy shrews and that type of thing. So really, I mean, the, the, the opening here is quite, right say, it's quite high up. You know, it's about, yeah. about 21 inches. But the good thing <coughs> with that is that when, by the time the young ones are fit to scramble up here, if they get out onto this perch here, That's where they'll if fledge. they fall off, they're ready for flying. Oh. If the hole was any further down, the young ones would fall out. Yeah, you know, so that's that's the idea. <coughs> it's there. Go yeah. Widen the shot again, Andrew, and back to the the, the medium shot. And that, it was nice to see that the uh, the barn owl in bringing its prey back in there. Presumably, the the, the mother barn owl, the female with the fled with the, the fledglings inside. Mm -hmm. She's standing there, looking around her, and if she's lucky, 
a rat or a vole or a, a mouse will will saunter by. Mm. Uh, well, what's the process for her well, well, getting well, that? Normally, what happens whenever the females in here with the young ones, <coughs> the male will usually feed her until oh. until the young ones get the surgeries where she can leave, where they're, they're all hatched out, and she'll then join the male. Initially, when she's incubating the eggs, the male does all the hunting. Yeah. And he's flat out. Is he a hunting. good partner? He's a very good, I mean, barn owls pair off for life. Unless really? something happens to one of them and they look for another mate, once they've set up, they're together, right? Plus, their nest site, they don't go about from place to place. They're very sedentary. They'll stay in this nest box or wherever it is their nest, and they're very sight faithful. Now, the male, he's out hunting. And if you think of it like this, a barn owl, an adult barn owl, will need about four wood mice every night just to keep itself alive. Itself, four? Right? So he has to feed himself. What size is a wood mouse? A wood mouse is around about 20 grams. You're, yeah. you're talking about. It's you know, like a dormouse, yeah. I would yeah. think. A yeah. wee tiny thing. If you thing. think of your, your average year house mouse, oh, yeah. it's, it's the same, like wee, basically yeah. the same yeah. size. Yeah. Pygmy shrews are a lot smaller. Pygmy shrew and weight's only about maybe 10 grams at the yeah. very most. Mm. They'll also take young brown rats. Mm. Right? Now, he has four of those to get for himself, plus he has to feed his good lady. Yeah. Plus, whenever the young hatch out, they have to start feeding them. Wow. So that's a lot of hunting that they're doing every yeah. night. Now, see, he's, he's out hunting and he brings back the yeah. food until the young ones are at a stage where she can go out and join. Then, once the young are about 10 or 11 weeks, they're more or less fully grown. Yes. And at that stage, the parents want to encourage them to leave home. Yeah. Right? Go out and sort yourself out, get oh your aye. own life. Oh, aye. And at that stage, that's when you hear the most noise coming from an egg. Don't want to go! Don't uh, want to go! Leave me it. alone! Because what happens, Mommy and Daddy stop feeding Junior. Wow. Right? And they, Where are you? they're screeching and crying yeah. and they make it. Now, I don't have any uh, any, any soundtracks with me. No. But, but if, we'll if your viewers go on and, and, and you know, Google, you'll certainly Google get it. put in barn owl calls. Yeah. You, you'll and hear, hear them. The young ones that make an awful hissing and snoring and, and an awful commotion oh, yeah. in the nest. And whenever. The parents stop feeding them. They really go bananas. Like they're really screeching. Can't, can't it's just like a youngster. Him. I'm starving, mommy. Home from yeah. school. I need my dinner. You know. Yeah. That's yeah. The, well, it's a whole narration and goes are, on here. Is, is there? Is, is it in their nature to be able to hunt the young ones, or have they been taught to hunt? The, it's it's in their nature. But what I have what I have seen happening would be one of the adults coming back onto the perch. Yeah. Right. Or if it's in a hollow tree onto a branch, and having a mouse with it, and dropping that mouse out to try and encourage them to, to go, go for it. And I've also seen the young ones doing what I call training flights, and they'll come out, and they'll stretch, and they'll get on, and the wings are all going out, here, and they'll whoa, 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 nearly go on, you know, yeah. and, and all of a sudden they'll take a wee dive, and out they'll go, and they'll bounce off the ground and back up again, yeah. and the next thing they're away, they're, they're soaring. And anyone who has seen a wild barn owl flying and hunting over a meadow, never ever forget that sight. They're yeah. absolutely fantastic. You see, they're a, big, they're a fair size, well, whereas, a, whereas a sparrowhawk is small. The sparrowhawk's small and the sparrowhawk's in and out he's like this. So you know, quickly. He's in and out, the barn owl, slow and steady. So, so, yeah. Barn wow. owls, uh, people think they're massive, but a barn owl, if it was sat in my hand, it's really only about a foot, foot about yeah. 30 centimetres, mm. but the wingspan almost a metre from tip to tip, Wow! and very broad wings, and that's so that they can fly slowly, and silently, when they're hunting, totally silent. Their feathers are adapted to muffle the sound of the wind rushing wow. over them. So a barn owl, if you can imagine it in here, a barn owl's really hunting over a meadow about the height of your ceiling, which is about what, 12 foot Quite up. low down. Low down. And again, most people think they're watching all the time. They are, but their sensory organ that they're using the most are their ears. They've got the most acute hearing of almost any animal. In fact, American scientists a few years ago carried out an experiment and they had a barn owl in a 30 metre square room yeah. and they put a wood mouse into the far corner. Wow. Total darkness, absolute pitch black. The barn owl was fit to pinpoint that wood mouse and catch it. God. And they reckon the only thing the barn owl could hear was the heartbeat of the mouse. Goodness gracious. Now, they have fantastic hearing, yeah. and you'll see them hunting, and they're turning their head from side to side all the Just time, looking. listening and watching. And when it locks on, it goes into an, almost a headstand, really? head first, down in, and at the last minute, it back 
and the big talons out, catch it, and that's it. And one squeeze, and your mouse or your shrew, your young rat, that's it. It's captive. It's going nowhere. Yeah. What to do then? Everything. Head first, tip of its nose, and it goes. It is the last thing in is the tail. It eats yeah. the whole thing. doesn't shred it up. No, so the, the pointy everything. beak is, is superfluous in yeah. that sense. doesn't need it. It just straight in. It eats yeah. the whole thing. Now, yeah. fascinating thing with barn Like, all birds of prey do this. The barn owl can only digest so much of that. It yeah. can't digest the fur. Regurgitates. And it can't digest the bone. Yeah. So what it then does, its stomach, it has two stomachs. The second stomach acts like a, a slow cycle on the washing machine. Yeah. And it's turning around this thing and it produces a fur ball. Or wow. a pellet, we call it. A pellet. A pellet. I have some in this wow. box here. Now, there's a wee bit of a musty smell off them, but if I can see here. Wow, look at this. Now, that's a barn owl, that's a barn owl pellet. Andrew, right. you're, he, he, he has eaten that. He has eaten this. Now, in this, you have to remember, he only produces one of these. Can we go tight on that, Andy? One of these about every 10 or 12 hours. So basically, yeah. one a day he's pushing out. But does he cack as well as doing oh, that? Oh, yes. Right, but They're two separate uh, events. Oh, oh yeah, but it, w the drop ones are like whitewash, and yeah. that's a telltale sign. When I'm looking for barnows, and it, they maybe roost up on, on, a, on a ledge or on a beam, and whenever they do their own, it comes out like whitewash, just a splash. Yeah. But this, they just spit, they don't rat, when you, they twist their necks and they straighten up on the strain, and the next thing they open their mouth and out this pops. It's half, that, it half looks like a mouse. Oh, I mean, you can see the fur. Yeah. It's grey, and you can see the bits of hair. Now, you see his ears. I'll show you this one here. This is one that I've taken apart a wee bit. Come and in now, tight, Andrew. Hold now, it for now, Andrew. Now, do you see yeah, that? Yeah, you yeah. You see that wee skull there? Yes. That's, that's he couldn't do anything with that skull. Now, there's a wee skull. And in that, if he's eating four wood mice, I would expect to find four wood mice skulls and jaw yeah. bones and all the rest of it. Here's one that I took apart, and that's a rat skull. Wow. Now, he would only need to eat one rat. Because there's enough calorific value in, in that the to keep him going, yeah. whereas he needs more wood meat and he needs a lot more pygmy shrew. Yes. Okay. So those are that's the pellet. Now that's a telltale saying. If I'm out surveying old buildings and looking uh, for barn owls, uh -huh. that's what I'm. I'm looking for these pellets. So you know they're there. I know the barn owls are there. Yeah. Now, whenever these are fresh, they're a lot darker than that, yes. and, 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 and yeah. they're, they're wet enough, but they dry out over a period of time. But those are fantastic. A great, a great tool for. The conservation of the barn owl, because I can look at those and take them apart yeah. and see what they've been eating. Yeah, you know. But there'd be no shortage of food for them. There's, there's not. Well, there's that's not, not where the threat would come from. There's not from. really a shortage of food. There has been some because, if you think about it, one of the reasons why the barn owl numbers have declined and they've really declined, I suppose since the Second World War, they've been in decline, and it's not just here in Northern Ireland. It's, it's all over, right? Mm. Uh, Ireland and, and, and right through Europe, and a, a lot of it's to do with changes in agricultural practice. Right? Yeah. Now, years ago, you and I remember this, were, were, uh, most farms, especially in Ireland, farmers grew a wee bit of everything. They, they did. They, they, they did. Corn, and, mm -hmm. and they had, they they had did. turnips or whatever, mm -hmm. and spuds, and then yep. they had hay meadows. Yep. And within that, you had you had lots of prey species for the barn, and you had lots of mice, and shrews, and young mm -hmm. rats, and that. Mm -hmm. And when the, har the, the, the farmer harvested the corn, he drew it into the yard, mm -hmm. and he tipped it up in an open shed. Uh huh. And the mice and all were running around. Running around, skilly, right. skilly, skilly. Nowadays, yeah. what happens? Right? You get farms and there's nothing but green grass everywhere. Mm. Right? Mm. Or, you know, they grow barley and wheat mm. and they harvest that and it goes into a steel silo. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's no vermin problem. Yeah. Right? Now, that's progress and we're, we're not against progress, but what that has done, it has had a bit of an, an impact on the amount of prey species. But there still are plenty of mason rats and yeah, pygmy shrews in the countryside, you know. Can you, can you fund farmers to dedicate a piece of land which would be there to encourage a, a, a diversity of species for the barn owl? We don't actually fund them, but under the, the uh, Northern Ireland Countryside Management Scheme, the yes. Agri Environment Scheme, mm. now that, that's all being looked at again with cap reform coming in. Oh, yes, so more, we want more money out of the cap for yeah, this. Yeah, the cap is the, cent the uh, 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 Central uh, the Agriculture, common agricultural, common agricultural, yeah. agricultural yeah. Policy and, and from and Europe. And within that, uh, there's a certain amount of that gets yeah. diverted into Agri Environment mm. Schemes, where, where farmers can, can get grant money for, as you quite rightly say, implementing certain measures that will mm. help wildlife. Mm. Now, Part of my job is to go out and talk to, to landowners and, and land managers uh, in areas where we, we know their barn owl populations and say, look, you know, 
if, if you're in the countryside management scheme, the agri environment scheme, uh, can you think about maybe uh, doing something like leaving wide areas at the edges, uh, you know, mm. margins along mm. your fields, mm. yeah, and, and let them grow a bit rough, which provides yeah. habitat for these prey yeah. species? Yeah, uh, wild bird covers another fantastic, yeah. and that's a mixture of cereals uh, yeah. and, and sunflower seeds. You've maybe seen this around the yes. summer, yeah. growing strips of that is brilliant, not just for barnards, it's great for all the birds. Mm. But mm. also, you think about it, what a mason rat seed, they love eating seeds. They do. Right? Mm. And if you've got seed burn plants or trees or bushes, you're going to attract those prey species. And at this time of the year, when all that lovely sunflower seed and all the sunflowers and all the rest of it are falling down because of the frost, the mason rats are not. And yes. the barn owls and kestrels oh. and all of are hunting over yeah. that. Yeah. So really, we're really depending on farmers to help the way What live. response do you get from the The farmers are kindly people, but they're also hard-nosed mm. and uh, dogged people. And you're coming along as a fellow, uh, not in a suit, but you're coming along as a fellow from the city, so mm. to speak. You're going to talk to him about what he's going to do with his land. Uh, well, it's a big task to it convince. Is a, it is a big task. And, and I think, in my nature, uh, having had that bit of background with farming, I've never really have a suit on me. But no, of course. <laughs> But and, they might and, say, and, and, well, who is he? He's coming and, from Stormont or whatever. I, I, he might say that, I'd never erroneously. say, tell them what to do. Yeah. I Would you mind? Encourage Would them. Would you think about this? I try and get them enthusiastic Aye. about the way life they have. Yeah. Do you know you've got barn owls? Exactly. And do they know? No, well, some of them don't. Mm. Some of them do, and, and, and but they're not aware of the impact that they can have on them. Yeah. You know, they're aware that they're there, but they don't realise that, you know, what they need to survive. Mm. So it's a matter of just letting people know it's not educating but it's just informing people and yeah. saying you know you have this it's, a, it's an iconic species but don't there's a cultural identity with the barn owl as well what does uh, that mean well one example is i'm sure you've heard of the the banshee oh well now the the, the barn owl when it calls it screeches it doesn't wow. go hoot hoot twit twit or no. anything like that it screeches and a lot of people would reckon that that's where the story, banshee. the banshee's keening and screeching, that's mm -hmm. where it's the barn out. And that's not just an Irish thing, that's also from across the water. There was an old guy way back in the 1700s called Gilbert White, and he wrote probably the first natural history book that was ever published called A Natural History of Selborne. Selborne's a wee village in Hampshire. Yeah. Now, Gilbert White was a clergyman. And he wrote this fantastic book, and in it he writes about barn owls, among a lot of other wildlife, but he writes about barn owls, and he writes about, as he calls them, the common people. And their notion that the screeching of the barn owl was a hobgoblin or a spectre, and it was especially heard around the windows of dying people. So it's not just something that we have here, it's, it's across the water across as well. The water too. Barn owls have always had this reputation of... Uh, uh, sort of doom merchants, yeah. if we call that. And, and even the Romans, if they were going into battle and there was a barn owl flew across the legions, as it were, it was going to be a bad day. Yeah. Medieval farmers, they used to kill them and oh. nail them to the barn door to keep away the evil spirits. So oh. they're, they're, there's all, they're, because they've had a close association with man, I mean, they're known as the farmer's friend. Yeah. Because they read up all the mason rats around the yeah. farmyard. And do the farmers know that they're his friend? Well, I, th I think what has happened over the years, because of the reduction, it's been forgotten about. Mm. You know, and farmers nowadays, as I have to, I mean, we're all into food security and and, yeah. and, and biosecurity and that, and, and you have a duty to control vermin. I mean, any farmer that's in any of the farm assurance schemes, I mean, it's part of that that you have to control vermin yeah. and, and pest species, and and the main way of doing that is put down rat poison, rodenticides. Yeah. Well, here's a problem. You putting down rat poison, mm -hmm. the barn owl comes and gets the rat. Yeah. What happens then? What happens then is what we call secondary poisoning. Now, barn owls, again, like like some other birds of prey, they don't eat stuff that's already dead. As a rule, they catch that's, their that, prey. That's right? helpful for them. Now, if you but if you think about it, if a rat eats some rat poison today, that rat doesn't die today. It maybe takes a week for that rat to oh. die. It's a slow thing, right? So the, that rat's still out running about. Now it's maybe getting a wee bit slower. And the barn owl comes along, grabs it, and eats it. The poison that the rat has ingested or metabolized, mm -hmm. a certain percentage of that will get into the barn owl system. 
Yeah. And uh, there's been studies carried out in the south through Birdwatch Ireland, the University College Cork, and they they uh, tested all the road traffic casualty burnouts that they could find yeah. in the south, and over 85 percent of the ones that they tested <coughs> had traces of rodenticide, rat wow. poison, in their system. Mm. Now, that's a hard one for you to deal it, it with. It is a really hard one because. I mean, as I say, there is a, that obligation to control vermin, and we, we realise that. What, what there is, there's, a, there's an organisation called the, the Campaign for Responsible Redenticide Use. Yes. Now, it was launched in the UK a few years ago, and this year passed at the Plan Championships down in, down in uh, Strabale. Yeah. It was, uh, an Irish version was launched. C Crew, it's called CRRU, Ireland was launched. And that really produces a code of practice for users of redundancy, ah, yes, for responsible yeah. use. Yeah. And what I, I'm on the task force with that, and what we're trying to do is to educate pest controllers and farmers and, and make them aware of the impact that, mm. that using redundancy can have, not just in barnhouse, but on a whole raft of wildlife. Yeah. You know, but they're so. going to have to keep using that, John. But that's the thing, they do. They have to keep using it, but it's using it responsibly. You know, it's using what does that mean, well, using it, really it responsibly? Mean, well, what it means well, basically is that, what they've got to do is they've got to put it out there. Yeah, they have to put it out, but what we're saying is, look, do an environmental assessment first of all. A lot of farmers, you don't, and not just farmers, but all, I mean, it's not just farmers use this stuff. I mean, most local authorities are using it around yeah, towns course, and, 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 and industry, everywhere. You, and barnouts just aren't confined to the countryside. But what it says is, you know, have a look at it. Do you have barnouts or kestrels in your area? And if you do, is there another way that you can do this? Yeah. Is there another. Uh, <coughs> They like mm. maybe putting down traps. Yeah. Uh, and if you do have to use it, only use it for as long as is absolutely necessary. Don't leave it lying. Uh, and don't leave it lying. <coughs> and and, and use it in conjunction with what it says on the manufacturer's label. Yeah. Because some of them are specifically for use indoors, mm. and some of them can be used outdoors. Oh, so yeah. it's going by what it says on the label, mm. to say what it does in the tin. But then, if we had if we had enough uh, sufficient barn owl population. That would solve the problem. It, but it would be great if we had. Can more you burnouts. can you do what they did with the red kites? I think it was the red kites, where you're you're able to import mm. uh, to an area where there are only fifty surviving uh, uh, couples. Can you import maybe another fifty or a hundred uh, uh, barn owl uh, uh, pairs from an area that's got hundreds of them? And if you were able to do that. Would you have to set them up on a new colony, or could you bring them in at ten trees down the road from this fellow, or is he so so much a guardian of his territory he would mm. drive the other boy out? They're not. The barnards aren't. They're not territorial. They'll mm. not fight with all their barnards. They don't mind them coming no, in. They don't mind no. mixing. But the, the, no, this reintroduction and captive breeding programs they have been tried and trialed over over in England yeah. over the years. They've never really been a success. Aye. What we've found is that the, 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 the captive bred birds don't seem to have that hunting instinct, mm. you know, and, and the, the survival rate has been very poor for the amount of effort put into it. The red case has been a great success. Up yeah. there. I mean, they, mm. they're, really, they're really doing well. They're doing so well. I think Jim Wells is turning into a red nah. kite. <laughs> Good morning, Jim. I hope you hear this. He's been in with me talking right, about them. Uh, well, he's, he's a great he's man, a great man for, for the raptors, the raptors and, and yeah. the peregrines and that. You yeah. Know, so, but yeah, yeah, I mean, well, have, it has been looked at and it has never really been a success. Yeah. Uh, and would rather not go down that road. Okay. What would rather do is work with the population we have. Right. And, and, and again, part of the problem is that, quite honestly, we don't know exactly how, how many, many barn owls we have. Mm. And, and part of my job over the next few years is to survey and try and get a better picture of what yeah. we have. And that's where I'm really appealing to local so communities. So let's, 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 we'll cut to the chase then. That's where we are. We've done all the general chat. What can we as a community do, living in Newry or living in uh, Hillsborough or living in uh, Cumber or wherever, we're surrounded by lakes and valleys and hills, mountains, mm. what can we do to assist you in your work? big thing that, that, that you know, your average member of the public do is report any sightings. Now, unfortunately the barn owl here is mainly nocturnal. Yeah. And the only time People see them as when they're driving out at night, and you see this flash of white in the car headlights. Mm -hmm. And what was that? It, it could have been a barn owl, or it could have been one of our other owls, yeah. like, like the long-eared owl. Mm -hmm. But 
Are they experiencing similar difficulties? Not, not particularly. Again, there hasn't been a big lot of survey and work done okay. on the long eared long eared but bar now specifically because we know they are really being yeah, threatened. Yeah, So that's why but you're funded a, to do this yes, work. It's very important that any sightings are reported yeah. because even if someone rings me or emails me and says, "Look, John, I think I saw a bar now last night. I was driving home at eleven o'clock and saw this place." Even if they're not 100 percent sure, I'll record that, yeah. and that helps me to build a picture in that yeah. area. If I mm. get another sighting mm. in from mm. around that area, mm. so I can then, you know, it's working on on the intelligence from mm. what people provide me with sightings like that are important. What's really, really important for my work is to find nest sites, and that's really what I'm appealing for. If anybody has any knowledge of a, a nest site, and the search for nest sites could take place during daylight hours. Oh yes, yes. yes. But what I would say to people is, I mean. I'm not actually asking people to go out and uh, proactively look for nest sites, but I'm saying that if anyone has knowledge, especially landowners, and, and they think, well, I see barn owls in that area all the time in a spot, please let me know about those because it's vital that we monitor the nest sites. Vital so we can see what their productivity is like and yeah. how they're doing. 2013 was a dreadful year for barn owl productivity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely shocking. I mean, uh, right across Europe, it was really bad. You're talking about, you know, in England, there's a, an organisation called the Barn Owl Trust who monitor nest sites, and they normally would have about 60% success rate from those nest sites. Last year, the 12%. Why? The bad spring. We had an atrociously wet spring, plus that late snow that we had. God help us, we're, and that's where we are. Exactly, now and, and, and we're, we're hoping that, that you know, we'll get a bit of good weather coming into the spring now. And, and a female barn owl has to put on another third of her weight to get into breeding condition. Yeah. And she does that in the early spring. Mm. And they weren't able to do that. And those that did, when it came to sitting on eggs and incubating eggs, they had to go out and hunt for themselves. Yes. And the eggs got yeah. chilled. So there's oh. a, a, it was been a disaster. So what we really, really want to find more nest sites so that we can monitor them. Uh, and that's what we're, also the other thing, local communities. I mean, uh, last night I was at Bestbrook. I was, I was at Bestbrook <coughs> Community Centre talking to people yes. about how local communities can get involved. I mean, even building the likes of these. Yeah. On the first Saturday in February, I'm running a, a, a nest box building workshop over at Mullaban. Mullaban, uh, and, yeah. And, and uh, we'll be doing that. I had one last year up at the Ring of Gullion, the courtyard there. Yeah. It's a great way for community to get together and do yeah. something that's really And you will, be, you will be in Mullaban. Where in Mullaban? Uh, it's at the... T Cullen. T Cullen. T Cullen in Mullaban. Yeah. When, the first Saturday in first February. Saturday in February. On the afternoon. First from, Saturday in February, the afternoon. T. Cullen Mullabon. Yeah. From build a nesting box for a barn owl. From two to four. Now, if anyone, uh, you have to book onto that. Oh, and I have two people who'll go to you, Tony and Molly. If, and I, yeah, I tell you. If, yeah. if, if they, they get onto the Ring of Gullion website, there's a yep. booking form online there. And right. You need to book it because places are limited. Okay, we'll get want, them moving I, I, on I, I'd it. I'd love hundreds of people, but I can't no, cope with no, them. No, no, no. But I'll be doing more of them. Yes. The other thing is, I mean, it's, it's, it's for people to get, I mean, I had the uh, the second year joinery students at the uh, Southern Regional College at, the, at, at Greenbank. There. Yes, built me fifteen of these before uh, Christmas. That's great. I mean, so well done, Brian. Uh, Brian uh, Doran. I, it's great to get communities involved and doing yeah. stuff like that. I mean, what I would also like to do eventually is to set up uh, within County Armagh, so set up like a barn owl watch group, yes, if you want to call it, yes. for, for local people who are interested and who want to do a bit of survey and work, okay. get out there and survey old buildings, look at yeah. it, and for, That's you, great. you know, rather than me, you know, come from Ulster Wildlife and Cross Gar, yeah. as an outsider, to get, it's local people, it's, well, your, you, it's your wildlife. You might be Ulster Wildlife from Cross Gar, but you've made yourself very much at home among oh, us, oh, oh, for yeah, goodness yeah. sake, you, you know Mullabon, <laughs> you know Jay Gull, you know the Ring of Gullion. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm a great believer. You have to get out there and, and, and with the people and work with them, you know, to get things done. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's the people that, in the country, it's, it's, it's our way life. Yeah. And if we don't do something about it collectively, we're going to lose it. I mean, okay. the barn owl, as I say, it's, it's on the brink and it needs, it needs protection. It needs yeah. looked after. It, it, you know, it, it deserves a place in, in, our, in, our, in our natural history and in our folklore. And in our ongoing lives. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Let's be very, very specific for people. You want to know where to contact John Woolsey. Mm. John, tell the people directly how they make contact with you. If you on, on, on my uh, email address is uh, john.woolsey at ulsterwildlife.org. Uh, you can email me on that or you can ring in on 07 598 371 361. That's direct into my mobile 
and I'll certainly be glad to talk to anyone who has any information or is interested in getting involved get involved in helping to conserve this species. Let's give them the email again. Yeah. Nice and slowly. John.Woolsey, that's W-O-O-L-S-E-Y, at ulsterwildlife.org. And barn owls forever. Thanks very much. Go well, God bless you. Thank you, John. Come on. Music, sir.